Hello, and uh, welcome to the latest presentation in our Valley webinar series. Uh, my name is Andrew Harvey, and because our usual host will be presenting today, uh, I'll be our host for this talk. Uh, so if you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application, and uh, we'll also be taking voice questions during the discussion of the webinar uh, the discussion section of the webinar at the end of Anna's talk. Uh, so uh, during that section, I'll enable that functionality and uh, I'll explain how we use that at that point. So Rift Valley Network member Anna Coit is a PhD student in linguistics in the digital humanities track at the University of Verona. She is a research MA in linguistics from Leiden University, which she completed in 2017. Anna is currently working on the morphology of the case systems of Germanic and Romance varieties spoken in northern Italy in the regions of Trentino Alto, Adige Sud Tyrol, and the Veneto. She works in the Vinco Variations in Contact project hosted by the universities of Verona and Trento, which aims to collect oral data from non-standard varieties through online crowdsourcing. Anna's research interests include morphology, syntax, and documentation and description of minority languages. She has a strong interest in language revitalization, creating community resources, and issues surrounding language endangerment. She's also interested in the use of digital tools for data collection and field work. And uh, the title of her talk today is Varieties in Contact, VINCO, Online Data Collection in Non-Standard Linguistic Varieties. And with that, I will uh, ask everybody to welcome Anna, and uh, I'll give the floor to her to begin her talk right now. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for that really nice introduction. Um, yeah, so you might know me as the host of these webinars, but this will be my first time presenting, precisely because I don't work with Rift Valley languages at the moment. So the project I do work in is called Finco. It stands for Varieties in Contact. It's an online data collection project in which we're collecting oral data for non-standard linguistic varieties. And let's see if this works. There we go. Um, so uh, I just want to give a brief overview of what this presentation is going to look like. I'm mainly going to focus on methodology since I don't think the linguistic data in itself might be of interest for this research group. Um, on the other hand, I do want to make sure that um, it's understood in what kind of linguistic environment the project um, is set. I of course, want to show some of the results just so it reflects the kind of data that we're collecting at the moment. So I'll start by introducing the Vinco project and its linguistic environment. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the digital data collection that we're doing, particularly the stimulus and questionnaire design. Then I'll talk a little bit about how um, this puts um, out data for the researchers, so the data access that we have and some of the preliminary results that we get. Uh, I want to discuss as well the community platform that we're building at the moment, so the public outreach we're doing and the engagement we're planning. Then I want to provide a brief overview and at the end I want to open the floor for discussion. So I'll first go over some of the practical issues which are obviously involved in digital data collection uh, projects. Um, and then I want to discuss how this might be interested either for the Rift Valley area in general or maybe for this research group in particular. Um, so this is an ongoing project. We're still very much working on data collection, which also means that we don't have any um, conclusive results or the evaluation is not complete yet either. So just keep that in mind. So the Vinco project is a collaborative project of the universities of Verona. Um, as you can see, it's located very far outside of the Rift Valley area. And it focuses on the non-standard varieties which are spoken in the regions of Trentino Alto Adige Sutiro, Veneto and Friuli Venezia Giulia. Um, so the linguistic area looks roughly like this. It's for European standards pretty diverse linguistically. It's a border region between two major branches of the Indo-European language family. So the Germanic branch and the Romance branch. We divide the area in roughly six umbrella linguistic variety terms. There's a lot of micro variation. There's a lot of internal dialects as well. So keep that in mind. But these are the terms we mainly use. So uh, we have three Germanic varieties. Up north there's Tyrolean, which is a South Bavarian dialect. Um, we are only looking at the uh, Italian speakers at the moment, but obviously this dialect goes on into Austria and Switzerland as well. And there are two um, Germanic minority languages, Zimbrian and Mokano. 
They are both from self-Bavarian descent, but they've been isolated from the self-Bavarian dialect continuum for hundreds of years by now. So they've had a lot of independent developments and a lot of contact from Roman speakers. Um, so we treat them as uh, either Germanic islands or Germanic minority languages, whatever term you prefer. We, the ter um, we have two terms for the Romance varieties, Veneto and Trentino. Technically, Trentino also falls under the uh, Veneto dialect continuum. However, since this is the variety where we have the contact with the Germanic languages, where there's contact with the Lombard dialect continuum to the west, um, often this is uh, distinguished as a um, uh, separate group. Um, but this is mainly done on geographical um, properties rather than linguistic ones. And last but not least, we have uh, a lot uh, of Ladin varieties. We distinguish at least five different dialects, which is a Rato Romance language. As you can see, it sort of straddles the border between the Romance and the Germanic areas. So then I come to introducing Finko. Um, this is what it looks like at the moment. It's a website, uh, and at the moment, it only collects data. Um, so if you're a speaker of one of the varieties that I mentioned in the last slide, you can go to the website, click on participate, and you can uh, complete the questionnaires that we have available at the moment. We're hopeful of launching a new version of the website in the coming weeks or at the latest at the end of the summer, uh, in which we're going to have new features, which I'll be discussing later on in the talk. Now, I'm pretty sure that uh, there's not so many there's not a large chance that in, in this uh, audience there's many speakers of uh, the varieties I'm talking about. Um, but if you do speak uh, a language variety from the northern parts of Italy, or if you know someone who does, please participate. So we're still actively looking for particularly members of minority speech communities. So Vinco is an offspring project of an earlier project called Athene, which stood for Advancing the European Multilingual Experience, which was a project funded by the European Union Seventh Framework Programme from 2014 to 2019. This was a more traditional project, it did traditional field work, it had paper questionnaires, uh, which were conducted on location. And uh, in the research site, it looked at an analysis of selected phonological, morphological and syntactic variables in geologically not closely related, so Germanic and Romance dialects located in multilingual regions in order to probe contact and do change. Now, as a result, this project found that there's a lot of micro variation in this area, even within very small areas. So from village to village, you can find different structures. And there were uh, a lot of interesting cases of alignment of surface structures, even though deep structures seem to be more resilient and more um, retaining of older systems rather than being uh, long contact induced uh, change. Uh, but it did have some disadvantages, uh, particularly disadvantages that we are probably all familiar with. So it was very time and money consuming. Um, since there's such a high degree of micro variation, it was uh, the location network that we had was too coarse meshed uh, in order to provide a clear picture of the linguistic situation on the ground. And there were issues with storage of and access to the data. Um, so again, we have paper questionnaires and large accentmented uh, audio files. We have researchers in the group uh, across different universities um, in different cities, which makes it a lot uh, harder to share the data. Uh, without first analyzing and segmenting and so on. So that gave rise to the project Vinco. Um, its aims uh, research-wise are basically the same. So we're still looking for selected phonological, morphological and syntactic variables. Um, by the way that we're now collecting data, this would provide a geographical mapping of linguistic forms and patterns which investigate for language contact uh, and provide synchronic insight into overlaps and variation across linguistic systems. And the way that Finko aims to do this is um, using digital online data collection, using crowdsourcing. And the idea behind it is that this would uh, lead to a massive amount of data, good coverage of the entire survey area, and structured storage with easy access for every research group member via the web. So the first version of Vinco was online about two years ago. Um, the platform worked, it collected data, and the data was accessible via the web. Um, but it's still in its children's shoes, so it had some problems as well. Like there was not the amount of data that we were hoping for, there was no good coverage of the area, and there's no higher level, uh, higher level tools for data extraction, grouping, or comparison. So we're now currently working on Vinco version 2.0. Um, this is the part where I got involved, um, and what we've uh, introduced here is um, some new methodological approaches to data collection. So the previous questionnaires which were online have been updated, 
um, and I developed a new morphological questionnaire. Um, the data storage has been vastly improved, so there's an easier comparison of responses uh, per stimuli, variety, locality, etc. And we've started uh, building a community-directed platform. It's now under development, but in the new version, it's going to be launched hopefully soon. Um, it should be available online for everyone. In which we're building an interactive map with audio files. And we're providing basic background information on the language varieties uh, in the area. So to start off with digital data collection. Um, so it's a collaborative research project. We all have our own research interests, um, but we share the platform on which we do this research. Uh, it does mean that we have individual questionnaires, which have quite different formats, depending on the research topic we have and the approaches we take to field work. Um, so it's interesting as well to look at what kind of new methodological approaches we can take to these type of questionnaires and what will work and what will not work in an online medium. Because uh, obviously methodology and stimuli design are impacted by the online nature of the data collection. So it's not necessarily a restrictive format, but it does mean that you have to take certain things into account. So what you lose is obviously the direct communication between researcher and participant. So participants have no opportunity to ask questions to the researcher or for the clarifica clarification or any of the sort. So tasks that you present online needs to be well explained, um, easy to understand and very clear in setup. Um, similarly for the researcher, there's no way to immediately ask follow-up questions or to um, ask an explanation for certain constructions. Um, so tasks also need to be as complete as possible in order to collect full paradigms or at least a clear picture of the situation on the ground. So you need to know quite well what you're looking for. And tasks need to be relatively engaging and not too long because board participants will simply leave. Since we're asking people to volunteer their own time, we should also be respectful of that time, not ask them to sit there for five hours. Um, and since you're not there in person, very few speakers are willing to to do something which they find boring uh, at home for hours on end. So you need to engage them at least uh, in some way. So at the moment we have three questionnaires available. Uh, the first one, the morphological questionnaire, is my part of the research. It's a picture aided translation task and a directed free speech task. It has a storyboard set up and I'm using the stimuli in standard languages, so standard German and standard Italian. Um, just to give an indication of how this can differ across questionnaires, the methodological approaches, uh, we also have a phonological questionnaire, which are individual words which are presented in isolation. And these are for the most part dialectalized since we have quite a lot of background literature on the uh, language varieties in the area. Um, so people just have to pronounce the words, they don't need to translate anything. And then there's a syntactical questionnaire, which are loose sentence translation tasks. Um, there's a limited amount of verbal context, but not much more, and these are also presented in the standard languages, so either standard Italian or standard German. Now I just briefly want to show the picture aided translation task, because this is the task where we try to address the potential problems with online data collection, as well as some problems which might exist for translation tasks in general. Um, so I think we all know the problems with translation tasks, like they might um, spark word-for-word -word translation, unnatural constructions, and so on. So in order to alleviate some of these issues, um, I created the picture aided translation task with a storyboard setup. So people do not just look at the stimuli they get presented, but they have a story to focus on and uh, the pictures to provide further context. And the idea is that this would make it easier uh, to comprehend the story and the task to make it easier for speakers and hopefully also a bit more engaging. Uh, I'm particularly interested in personal pronouns, which in Romance languages only occur in very specific uh, environments. So either focus or uh, contrastive focus or uh, change of subject. So for this, you need very clear reference in the story and you need good contextualization of sentences in order to get the, uh, the morphemes we're looking for. And there's also the hope that it's a bit more engaging than a traditional translation task. So I've given here three pictures from the first story. So I have two stories in total. They're based on very, let's say, traditional Indo-European uh, fairy tale motives that we're all familiar with, especially from collection books like The Brothers of Grimm. Um, so these are pictures taken from the first story. They're not sequential, but they uh, give a good indication of the stories about. So in the first picture, there is a witch who has captured some of the children of a local village. 
um, she tries to eat and cook the children as witches do. Luckily, two of the children have escaped and they uh, went to the back to the village to get the hunter um, to solve the problem. Uh, then in the second picture, there are two children in the cage and there's the older sister who's trying to protect her baby brother saying, oh, don't eat him, eat me. I'm much fatter than he is. And then, of course, just in time, the hunter comes to the rescue, um, kills the witch and therefore saves the children. So as you can see, these are quite cartoonish uh, pictures. I'm, I'm not an artist, so I can't really make anything more sophisticated, but they, are, they should at least be um, clear, so speakers know exactly the emotions involved, the story involved, and so on. And speakers report their own responses. Um, so we decided to go for oral responses, as we feel these are often more spontaneous and more natural language use. Um, also because we're working with primarily oral varieties, that doesn't mean that there's no standard orthography for most of them. It's just that most speakers will either not know the standard orthography or not be practiced in writing it. And we wanted to get away from problems of uh, how would I spell the certain sounds uh, for speakers. So what participants do is they use the microphone on their own device, click a button and they record the response they want to give. Um, and this goes actually really well. So in most modern devices like laptops, tablets, phones, there are at the moment really decent microphones installed. Um, so a vast majority of the responses we get is perfect for uh, linguistic analysis. Maybe not if you want to go very deep in the phonotactics. Uh, it might not be sufficient, but for any other research, uh, the, the quality is good. So now I just want to briefly look at what kind of data this gives uh, once people complete the questionnaire. So how do we access the data? How can we extract the data and analyze it? And I want to show a few of the results just to show some of the advantages of immediately being able to plot the collected data onto specific localities. So this is the admin side of Vinco. This is restricted access uh, at the moment only available for the researchers in the research team. Um, but it is freely available uh, across all different uh, universities, locations, wherever our researchers uh, tend to be. And the moment someone completes a questionnaire, we immediately have this in the database. You can see how many there are present in total, which linguistic varieties there are for. And then when you go to the audio section, you can immediately select for the variety you're interested in, uh, even locality. So if you want to look at a certain province or even a certain village, you can immediately do so. You select for whatever stimuli you're looking at. So here the first sentence of the first story has been selected and we'll give you a list of all the oral responses that we have. So every single audio. Um, the, the files are already segmented. So you can see here the first recording is four seconds. The second one is six. Um, and you can just listen to them, compare them immediately at once. There's a, a little bit of uh, linguistic background information on participants available too. So the first speaker here from Verona, she's a female of 24 years old who uses the dialect regularly. And then the second one is from Ninago. It's a male speaker, he's 36, and he also uses on a regular basis. So you already have a little bit of background on each speaker available. And so you can start comparing every stimuli you have. And once you do this, you analyze and transcribe. Um, using the, the localities we collected, you can immediately plot the data on a map, which can give you a really nice overview of where your speakers are, um, how they're distributed across the area, uh, where you might be missing speakers still, and so on. So this is a map of the questionnaires we have at the moment for the morphological questionnaire. Uh, the different colors represent different language varieties. So up north, uh, the purple markers are the Tyrolean speakers. Uh, as you can see, we have a fair number of them. They're well distributed across the area. Then in the south, we have the green markers, which are the Veneto speakers. Uh, which you can see are clustered around Verona for quite obvious reasons, um, but still there's a fair number of them. Uh, in the middle between the two groups, we have the dark orange color, which are uh, Trentino speakers. And we have two Ladin varieties, one from Fasan and the other one from Ampensano, so a blue marker and a yellow marker. And this already shows that we're still missing a lot of the, the, the minority, the Ladin varieties, as well as simply in Amokano, we still need to collect more data. But with the data that we already have, we can already see some interesting patterns. So just to give an example of the kind of data we're collecting, or the, at least the morphological questionnaire here is collecting, these are the surface forms that we have for the third person plural dative case. Um, so you can already see there's quite a lot of variation in the Tyrolean area. So we have, let's say, at least three different forms, inen, imenen, and sui. 
Uh, we also have some speakers who are not using a personal pronoun, but the anderen, so the others, um, but they do use this preposition in, which might be interesting. Um, whereas in the Romans variety, we find uh, also different phonological realization of uh, forms like alori, aiori, aluri, and then for the Latin varieties, alore and a each. And if you want to look at this from a more um, systematic approach, um, the more abstract level of the morphological paradigms that they have, um, you can also select for this. So, for example, in the Trollian area, we see that we have at least two major um, two major uh, paradigms. So the first one is the one which is most similar to standard German. In the third person plural, uh, we have a single form for nominative and accusative, something along the lines of C. And then we have a distinct dative case. So this can either be inen or imenen. This is less important, but we have a distinct marking of dative. However, there's also to the west, uh, these are the pink markers. We have varieties which do not make any case distinctions anymore. So it's used in the nominative, it's used in the accusative and dative. Now skipping to number four, uh, these are our Roman speakers for the most part. They have a single form of a pronoun, um, so this would be something like lori or iori, uh, but in the dative it needs to be preceded by a preposition, which for the Romans varieties is a. Now quite interestingly for some of the Trollian varieties, so the Germanic ones, we find a pattern uh, along the lines of number three. Again, this is not a fixed result or anything. We're still doing this research, seeing where it comes from. But there are varieties there that use a preposition in, uh, followed either by a distinct dative case uh, or something else. And uh, there are some varieties in previous research where this might have been an indication of uh, contact-induced change, since there are these always uh, existing prepositions in the Romans. This might, uh, on a systematic level, have transferred into some of the Germanic varieties there as well. So that brings me to the half-time evaluation. So there are some important questions to ask with these kind of new methodologies. So does the methodology work and does the task design work? Does the collected data resemble natural language use? And how many participants are being reached and who are they? Again, we're still collecting data, so I can't give any conclusive results, um, but we already have some indications of uh, how things are going. If, uh, if there were major problems, we should have spotted them by now. So the one thing I don't have any real results in at the moment is task design because we still have to do evaluation uh, and user feedback in order to figure that out. Um, but the questions are, does the storyboard setup work? Uh, does it yield better data than perhaps traditional translation tasks? And also how do speakers feel about these tasks in opposition to traditional translation tasks? So we have some anecdotal evidence that uh, speakers might find it use easier to do the storyboard setups. Um, and that they like using the pictures, it makes it easier and more engaging. Then again, this still needs to be um, evaluated in a more quantitative manner. Um, but the, the audio data does show that uh, speakers are clearly engaging with the story. So you can tell in the way that they're translating that they have sort of the, let's call it storytelling prosody involved. So um, I'll let you listen to three recordings, each belonging to one of the different pictures you see here of the storyboard that we've seen before. And they're from a Veneto speaker from uh, San Donato di Piave. A striga a vol cucinare i putei ciapai. Non sta a mangiare lu, mangia me mi, son pi grassa de lu. E ora lu ciapa il fusil e il copa a strega. So it's clear that speakers are participating and engaging with the story as a story in itself, um, which is a good thing. And I'm happy uh, to hear that you have a lot of these recordings where people are obviously not getting too bored out of their minds. Um, and it also means that they contextualize in these the proper way. They know exactly how they need to translate it uh, and that hopefully it helps to make it a better task that way. Um, because the data quality is, of course, quite important. Um, so we've already started seeing and testing if it's in line with the expectations that we have for dialect language use. Testing for natural language use is uh, basically almost impossible, like it's a really hard thing to do. But for these varieties, we have previous traditional fieldwork um, data that we have. There's a lot of existing literature, and especially the Veneto varieties, but also the Tyrolean one in the whole area, basically. So we can already check some of the structures we see, if it is what we expect to see, and if speakers are using what we think would be natural language use. So this is a sentence from, uh, again, a Veneto speaker. Allora, Lou, 
el tole el chopo y el copa la estrella. So this bold-faced element L here, it's a third-person singular masculine subject clitic. Now subject clitics don't exist in standard Italian, so you can already see in the stimuli underneath, Allora lui prendi su fucile in uccide la strega. It's not available, so it cannot be a translation effect. Um, and we also know that these subject clitics are obligatory, uh, at least the third-person ones, in every sentence, and that's indeed how we're finding them. So these are clear indications that the dialectal patterns that we expect are being used and uh, its natural language use. When it comes to participants, um, we already kind of know that the crowdsourcing aspect has not worked so far, at least, because the speakers that we have at the moment, we know have been individually approached by members of the research team. Um, but we still have a fair number of them, which is a good thing. Um, often for digital uh, research, they say that it might appeal more to younger generations and younger speakers. Um, and we do have sort of a screwing of, um, of a younger generation in the data. Uh, it's just probably the way that we've promoted the platform. So, um, so far it's been promoted in a university setting and that definitely affected the type of participants we get. So there's only two major groups where we can already do some evaluation on speaker profiles. For the other ones, we don't have enough data that uh, doesn't make any sense yet. So for the Veneto, there's 35 different speakers in the database at the moment. They come from 26 different locations. Their average age is 37 and they have a fairly equal gender distribution. And even though in this group also we find an overrepresentation of the 18 to 30 year old category, um, we have speakers from across the board, I think the oldest in the six, in their 60s. So we know also older speakers know how to use the platform and might not have uh, necessarily problems with it. Uh, for Tyrolean, we have by far the most questionnaires uh, at the moment. There's 72 of them, 51 different locations, um, and they're spread really well across the area. So we're really happy with that. Um, however, they are a very particular type of speaker. So their average age is 22 and 94% of them is female. And again, we already know that this is because it was promoted in the linguistic department in Bolzano. So uh, students are obviously young and linguistic students are uh, predominantly female. So it's very much still a work in progress. Uh, we're still doing data collection. Of course, the evaluation will need to um, constantly be updated as well. The data export options still need to be improved, even though we now have to a point where it's uh, very useful for immediate analysis and uh, research. And then comes the natural thing of transcription analysis and publication of findings. Then I want to briefly discuss the community output. So this is going to be completely new to the new version that's going to come online uh, because we do find it important to provide the collected data back to the community as fast as we can. We're asking them to put effort in, so the least we can do is to provide it back to them as soon as possible in an engaging form uh, in an easily accessible format. Um, as well as having more transparency in research in this way, so they know which data we're collecting, where from, and what we're doing with it. Um, it's also important to engage and inform on the bilingualism and multilingualism in the area, because many speakers might not know about the minority languages or about the big differences even between their own um, uh, linguistic variety group. Uh, and we find it important to represent non-standard minority varieties as part of the digital world, again, to heighten prestige, uh, there's a fair number of dialects which are uh, rapidly using uh, younger generation speakers because either parents don't speak to their children anymore or they move away from their hometown, they won't use it, um, and so on. And this is also because of low prestige. So the new website is roughly going to look something like this. Uh, it's an interactive map with audio files, so it's going to be, this is going to be, the map is going to be the main focal point of the community platform. This is going to be freely accessible. You don't need to log in or anything. So anyone coming to the new page um, would be able to immediately access it. Um, people will be able to select for a certain sound or a certain sentence or perhaps a part of a story. See on the map which questionnaires are available, click on the markers they find and then just listen to the audio recordings that we have available. Um, and this is very much community directed. So we're not directing this at the research community. So we're using as non-linguists terms uh, as possible. Um, apart from that, we also aim to inform should people then get interested about certain varieties that they see on the map or meet on the map. Um, they can go and look up a little bit of background information, some literature should be interesting. And um, uh, we have a lot of the online resources which exist for many of the minority varieties. 
uh, connected here as well, so we can tie into those kind of projects. Particularly, the minority languages have very strong cultural institutes with uh, massive databases, with uh, books, stories, and so on, um, in order to promote the language. And we really want to tie into that as much as we possibly can. Again, this is also a work in progress. So this new version, we're already thinking about how we're going to improve. And there's a lot of options here. So there is a, a fair number of online dialect atlases uh, available in at least Europe at the moment. So in Germany and the Netherlands, there's already these kind of projects which are a few steps ahead. They have very engaging map games, for example, where you can listen to a certain audio file and then guess where that speaker might be from. Um, we also find it important to open up more of the dialogue with the community. So at the moment, it's a very much a one-way street of information. Uh, but in the future, you might uh, include things like a message board or evaluation forms to uh, allow for community feedback as well. So it's, uh, it's more of a dialogue rather than a one-way communication. Uh, so there's plenty of options here. It, it's, uh, it's, uh, we're working on how to develop this further, but there's definitely interesting things you can do and depending on which variety and which area you're working in, uh, some uh, solutions might be better suited than others. So there I just want to briefly give a summary overview why we chose to do online data collection rather than traditional field work. So there are distinct research benefits. It allows collaborative research, but also individual research interest. This data is very easily accessible for researchers in different locations, universities, countries, and so on. Uh, it allows for greater spread of data collection area overview, so we can cover a way bigger area than we could if we were doing it in person. And for the community, there's clear benefits as well. So data can easily and very quickly be provided back to community members. Now, obviously, a map like the one I showed before is not as high quality final product as would be a dictionary or a grammar, uh, but those take years to evolve and years to develop, whereas this map can be very quickly, people can see exactly what they've done um, and the data is just not lying somewhere in someone's um, office at the university waiting to be used. Here it's immediately available. And that also allows for participation and involvement of a larger speech community. So even if you have speakers which might not speak the language themselves anymore, but maybe know it from their grandparents, this allows them to engage more directly with that. Uh, and again, the online presence of minority languages might heighten prestige of language and keep it relevant in the digital domain. Now, there's definitely practical issues involved. So you need basic requirements like internet access, mobile devices with decent microphones and people who know how to use them. Uh, again, this is why often they say that participation is uh, might be best suited to younger generations and younger speakers. But particularly since our platform is not very complicated in use, also the middle-aged group should easily be able to participate. So uh, the group that would be able to do it this way is growing um, every year, basically. And of course, there is a considerable cost involved in the technical setup and maintenance of digital platforms. In our case, yeah, this is definitely more cost effective than doing everything in person, which is that was one of the main drives for starting it. Uh, but yeah, you need a technician on staff to do the, uh, the more technical parts of it, and it needs to be hosted on someone's server and so on. And for the same reason, it sort of it, it promotes uh, collaboration more actively because then you can spread these kind of uh, efforts and the resources across different institutions. And then this is my last slide, and after this I will stop talking and uh, open up for discussion. So uh, how might this uh, be applied, or might this be relevant or interesting for the Rift Valley area? Now I know at this point everyone here has more experience in this area than I do, so I'd be really eager to hear you guys' feedback and the thoughts on this. Uh, but obviously there's no one-size-fits-all approach, so what we're doing in Northern Italy uh, cannot just be replicated in the Rift uh, and work since the digital infrastructure and the digital literacy are just extremely different. Uh, it depends on what kind of linguistic data you want to gather. Uh, it might not be suitable for all different researchers, so even though I think you can do a lot with it. Uh, mapping minority speech communities might not always be desirable, uh, but I think it can be potentially very interesting for research in urban communities. Um, I personally know that the Iraq, a lot of Iraqi speakers have an active Facebook page, which means they have internet access, they have mobile devices, and they have an interest in engaging in this way. And I think you can have really interesting options there. Um, yeah, so with that, I show you my references. So thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, I look forward to feedback. And of course, any questions you might have, I can answer.
All right, thank you, Anna. Um, this is the part of the presentation where uh, uh, we hand it over for questions. Uh, now, in the past, we've done uh, written questions only in the chat, which I, uh, which we still accept. So, if you would like to type your question in the chat module, you can. Uh, if you would like to ask a question uh, using uh, the uh, the microphone on your computer, if you'd like to ask a voice question, uh, you should be able to raise your hand. So if you go to the bottom, if you navigate to the bottom of your screen with your cursor and click uh, participants, uh, there should be a raise hand option for our participants. So you should be able to raise your hand uh, and in good time, I will unmute you and uh, you can give your question then. So I know that Richard has a question, so uh, I'll turn it over to Richard Griscom for the first question. Uh, yes, thank you, Andrew and Anna. Uh, this is a, a great talk and really interesting and um, yeah, very exciting new technology and uh, similar to uh, some other things that I, uh, some other tools that I know that linguists are exploring for uh, mobile and online data collection, um, especially based on methods that were originally designed for uh, laboratory use. Uh, so uh, laboratory phenology and things like that. Um, there are various platforms now that are available for collecting data online. And this looked like a, a really great implementation of that same idea um, specifically with this focus on uh, different varieties and also collecting uh, recordings. So I, I really enjoyed seeing that. Uh, one of my questions is just about the mobile phone interface or the mobile interface for the system. Um, so you had mentioned that recordings could be created using the internal microphone of a mobile device. And so I'm curious if it's necessary for the user to enter in any information into the device, like any text information, for example. Um, and then a follow-up question about the auto recordings. Um, all the transcriptions that we saw, were those then created by researchers uh, post hoc, or were any actual uh, orthographic transcriptions collected by some of the users? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard, yeah. Um... So first on the mobile phone. So um, I know that the majority of speakers just use their laptops basically. Um, so it is available uh, on the phone as well. You do need to log in. So we do ask some basic information from speakers. Uh, there's no app available. So it just all goes through like a browser. Um, yeah, so we, we ask for basic information about how they use the language. These are very brief. They just register and they can start immediately. It doesn't look very different on a mobile device. Um, than on uh, a regular laptop or uh, a tablet. Uh, the transcriptions are at a post hoc by researchers, so we don't, uh, we don't ask speakers particularly to transcribe anything uh, because we want to get away from that. And we don't have any automatic tools to do any transcription. Uh, since these are dialect varieties, that uh, is still a bit of a struggle. So I hope answers your questions. Uh, yes, um, thanks. Yeah, I have, I have another question, but I'm going to Hold on for now. Let's uh, give this um, to someone else. I'll jump in with a question of my own. On uh, I, I'm I'm interested in sort of the the data or or sort of the why of the uh, Vinco project. Some of these patterns, these linguistic patterns, are, are they are they patterns that are already well known uh, in the languages, or are they are you seeing new things? Uh, the reason why I'm asking is I, I, I'm wondering is sort of the focus on mapping where these varieties are spoken or is it in sort of determining the grammatical structures that are present in these languages? Um, oh, that's hard. I mean, for the most part, the constructions that we find are familiar. We might not always know that we're going to find them in a certain position. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of research on both Romans and Germanic minority languages across the entire border region. So there might be that we come across patterns which we might not have seen before for uh, the region where we're working at the moment, but that might have been seen before in Switzerland or another area where there are similar researches. Um, 
So I think it's a little bit of both. So the distribution right. is very important for the contact uh, that they have with other speakers to see if it's contact induced or just internal variation, which is always hard to determine anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's unlikely we're going to find something completely different, though, of course, with younger generation and language change, there might be certain jumps that we don't know about. There's a lot of varieties where the, the latest data is maybe 40, 50 years old. So, yeah. Very cool. Um, I see that Mike Arani has a question in the chat. Uh, he asks, how do you motivate participants so that they are willing to spend their time and their internet to provide data? Uh, he says, I know with traditional field work, one can give refreshments or some kind of compensation for their time. So how do you do this or do you do this uh, in the online format? Yeah, so that's a bit difficult. And that's also why we've still been struggling with doing the crowdsourcing, because also I think if you want to engage people so much that they also people that you don't know, or you haven't approached to please do it. Uh, engage their time. You do need to provide data back to show them what you're doing. So we hope in the future to make strangers engage as well. So, so far it's been mainly been people who have an interest in languages for themselves. So when it comes to lingua and linguistic students, they study languages, they're interested in it. Um, it's particularly in Tyrol, uh, the younger generation speak their local dialects really, really well. There's a strong national identity as well, which gives a further um, I mean, local identity, I should say, which gives a further drive to supply this kind of data. Um, and then also just if someone asks you to do it, uh, you know that person well, uh, that gives further motivation. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it's for internet, it's, I mean, it doesn't cost a lot of data in this region to do these questionnaires, so it's mainly an, an issue of time. Uh, and yeah, we're very grateful to everyone who does do it, uh, but it's mainly out of their own interest. So they might be interested in their own speech community. Uh, a lot of people who speak dialect, they also, they always find it interesting to say, oh, I say it like this, oh, you say it like that. And out of that kind of curiosity, people do, do participate. Right. Um, I see that we have a, uh, another question from um, Elena Vitslak Makarevich, uh, she's asking, uh, could you say a few words about the length of the recordings you get? And then overall, what time investment on the side of the participants your project decided is not really asking for too much? Yeah, so the, the length of the recordings is, I would say, somewhere between four to 10 seconds. Most of them will be around five to six seconds long. Um, so you do individual sentences, and sometimes there are two of them, so it's a bit longer. Um, but yeah, they're very short. It's uh, what kind of time investment? Not too much. That's a bit of a tricky question because I think we already know that at this point we're asking a bit too much. Our questionnaire is probably if you do all three of them on one in one go, it will probably take you close to two hours, which is a long time. Oh, yeah. you don't to do them in one go like it, because they log in you can log off again you can return it's just it, we already know that many people wouldn't return so quickly um so we know that that we're asking at the moment is too much uh on the other hand if you have a platform that people might return to because there's other things to do on it as well not just participate they might be more willing to split things up just do a, the morphological questionnaire which will take you i think i would say 20 minutes and then maybe the next time do some of the phonological or the syntactic questionnaire. Right. Ah, and uh, Richard has an audio question. Uh, ahead, uh, thanks, Richard. Andrew. Uh, so yes, concerning the, the audio recordings again, um, I'm curious uh, what kind of internet connection is required for the audio recordings to be made successfully. So to, do the users need to have a really strong and really stable internet connection? Or could it perhaps kind of uh, disconnect every now and then, and then the, the data would still be collected? It could definitely disconnect now and then. I mean, during recording, no, but again, these are five, six seconds. So it, it should probably be stable for that area, that, that length of time. Um, in between, uh, like it immediately gets registered and put into the server. So also if they quit halfway through a questionnaire or their internet cuts out, it will all be preserved. So that's no issue. Um, I haven't heard anything back that people had major issues with their internet connections. Uh, then again, internet connections in Northern Italy are in general relatively good. 
Um, but I mean, you don't need terribly fast internet or anything, no. Uh, one reason I'm asking it, well, as you can imagine, in the Rift Valley area, uh, in many areas of Tanzania and East Africa, more generally, um, the internet uh, connection might not be that stable. Uh, sometimes it might be really good and then it could just cut out for uh, a minute or two and then come back and it'd be really good again. Um, but also I'm, I'm imagining, it, as I, th I think uh, Michael Karani was alluding to, for a project like this to be implemented in, in Tanzania, um, it would probably make the most sense to have someone on the ground actually uh, with a device in their hands going around and um, uh, finding uh, participants uh, just uh, on the ground that way and probably compensating them in some way. But again, that would mean that the internet connection would have to be stable wherever they are and that they would most likely be using a mobile device so then my, my other follow-up question is, um, so do, do you know of users who have used the uh, platform through a mobile device and was their experience good? Were there any differences? Yeah, I think you're definitely right in saying that in the Rift, there would probably be a researcher on the ground doing it with their own mobile device. Uh, that's definitely what I think, if, if anything like this would be implemented, that's how it would work. When it comes to someone using their phone, like I haven't heard back. Again, we're still evaluating as well the uh, participant experience and how it worked. I'm pretty sure the majority, if not all of them, would have done it on their laptop. Uh, like I said, it, it's relatively long. Uh, a lot of them are students who have their laptop out all the time anyway, uh, and it's the easiest way to engage. So um, I'll ask a little bit, like I know the professors who've asked their students to do it. I'll see if they have had any feedback uh, about the mobile device, but at this point, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Okay, no thanks. I, I feel like this platform is really well suited to this task, even in an area like the Rift Valley area, as long as uh, certain steps are taken to make sure that the technology is compatible with the, the kind of infrastructure that's available. Yeah. No, I think that's also why it's particularly interesting. Like if you, I mean, we all go to different communities, know different people there. And again, as I also said, I think urban communities could be a really interesting way to, to start engaging a bit more and to have a more transparent way as well of doing research. Great. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, looking at, oh, I have a raised hand from uh, Martin uh, Mouse, so I'm going to unmute him. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Anna. Yes, like, uh, like many of us, I'm, I'm really trying to imagine something like this in, uh, in do, doing there in northern Tanzania. Uh, so I wasn't thinking along the lines that, that Richard mentioned, but I can see that, that you, if you do something like this and you go around. But there are two other things that I thought of, and one is that okay, um, you could do this kind of collection sort of one-to-one uh, -one with somebody that you know who, who has a, a good connection. But the other thing is that uh, to get the, 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 the crowd uh, in, in a way, and I, I'm really struggling with uh, finding ways that, that, that we can get some reactions to the things that we post uh, online. So we, we have some... Uh, YouTube uh, videos, we have a website, uh, Verda Africana, with a lot of Iraqo material. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether, um, whether, whether just, uh, uh, yeah, giving some opportunity of, uh, of giving feedback to, to a simple question would, um, would make these, uh, these outlets more popular and maybe would create more interaction between uh, the people who, who watch these things and, uh, and us who have put them on the, on the internet. So uh, what do you think or an, anybody else of, uh, of how we could take elements of this to, uh, to in integrate in, uh, in our research? Yeah, you bring up an interesting point, and it's difficult anyway to do um, good public outreach and community involvement because you never really know what people are looking for, uh, what might cause them to engage, um, also with things like the YouTube channel and so on. 
Yeah, I think there are people, like I said, I, I just know about the Facebook page of Iraqu speakers. So I know that there people are interested, engaging and actively um, talking to each other also because it's a community. So there is uh, an easy way for them to get into contact, not necessarily with any like researchers as it would be in this platform, but at least with other speakers. Uh, and I think that's something, especially if you make map games or uh, just an interactive map or anything which people can sort of relate to. So they can say, oh yeah, that's how I say it, or this is what we have, or that could be interesting ways uh, to do it. But yeah, I think it's a very tricky question and something definitely to be explored further. Looking ahead, the next uh, presentation in the webinar series will take place on August 12th, where Matthew Nisley will talk about disciplinary deja vu in linguistic, archeological and anthropological approaches in the Tanzanian Rift Valley area. With that, I'd like to end by thanking Anna and uh, reminding uh, listeners that all talks uh, that are part of our Rift Valley webinar series can be found on our YouTube page and are added as entries to our Rift Valley network bibliography. So uh, I'd ask everybody to join uh, me in thanking Anna for a really interesting uh, presentation. Uh, one that I think is 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 eminently applicable to uh, our situation, I think, with a bit of creativity and thought, some of which was laid out in our discussion today. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing all of you at our next talk. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.